Welcome to a Programming Languages virtual meetup pre-recording. My name is Connor Hookstra, and in this video, we're going to be covering chapter 4.4 of the structure and interpretation of computer programs. This is the last section of the fourth chapter before we move on to the final chapter of SICB, chapter five. Uh, this chapter section is entitled uh, 4.4 Logic Programming. It has four main subsections, 4.4.1, Deductive Information Retrieval, 4.4.2, How the Query System Works, 4.4.3, Is Logic Programming Mathematical Logic, and 4.4.4, Implementing the Query System, which is then further broken down into sub-subsections uh, that are enumerated below, 4.4.4.1 to 0.8. And if you look at the page numbers, you might uh, be thinking that this is quite a long chapter, and that is definitely the case. If we take a look at a chart that graphs the number of pages by uh, chapter, you will see that 17, which corresponds to uh, chapter 4.4, is definitely by far the uh, largest uh, chapter section, followed by the final chapter section, 5.5. Uh, 22, which is um, around 67 pages. Chapter 4.4 is 72 pages. Um, so I'm going to be doing a high-level summary of what's covered in uh, this chapter. I definitely recommend that you read through it yourself and work through the exercises to get a more comprehensive understanding. But um, doing a sort of in-depth covery of this chapter would make this video be longer than an hour, um, which I definitely want to try and avoid. So with that, let's jump into uh, the top of this chapter section. Uh, the textbook states, the non-deterministic program evaluator of section 4.3 also moves away from the view that programming is constructing algorithms from computing unidirectional functions. In a non-deterministic language, expressions can have more than one value, and as a result, the computation is dealing with relations rather than with single-valued functions. Logic programming extends this idea by combining a relational vi vision of programming with a powerful kind of symbolic pattern matching called unification. And uh, this paragraph ends with a footnote on the unification uh, keyword here, footnote 58. And if we jump to that, uh, we see this monstrosity of a footnote. We're not going to read through the entirety of this, but I'll read the beginning and the end because it is quite interesting. Um, it starts off by saying logic programming has grown out of a long history of research in automatic theorem proving. Early theorem proving programs could accomplish very little because they exhaustively searched the space of possible proofs. The major breakthrough that made such a search pl uh, plausible was the discovery in the early 1960s of the unification algorithm and the resolution principle. And then it goes on to talk about a number of resources um, that had to do with sort of the discovery of this unification algorithm. And if we jump down to the bottom, it says, uh, thus in assigning credit for the development of logic programming, the French can point to Prolog's genesis at the University of Marseille, while the British can highlight the work at the University of Edinburgh. And according to the people at MIT, logic programming was developed by these groups in an attempt to figure out what Hewitt was talking about in his brilliant but impenetrable PhD thesis. Uh, for a history of logic programming, see Robinson 1983. So the point here being is that unification, very important for sort of a breakthrough in these logic programming languages. And depending on whether you are English, French, or went to MIT, uh, you might point towards a different sort of source of uh, where this breakthrough happened. Um, and I encourage you to read the full note if you are interested. With that, we'll move on to uh, something else that the textbook states in sort of the uh, preface to uh, subsection 4.4.1. The text reads, earlier in this chapter, we explored the technology of implementing interpreters and describe the elements that are essential to an interpreter for a Lisp-like language, indeed to an interpreter for a, any conventional language. Now, we will apply these ideas to discuss an interpreter for a logic programming language. We call this language the query language because it is very useful for retrieving information from, a, uh, from databases for formulating queries or questions expressed in the language. So it's interesting to note that uh, I didn't know much about logic programming languages uh, before sort of reading this chapter or chapter section. Um, I knew that the most popular logic programming language, as many people do, is Prolog, but I don't know anything about it. Um, I was expecting something slightly different from this chapter. Um, I would I would summarize this chapter in a single sentence by saying that uh, the logic programming language presented is basically a fancy pattern matching engine. Um, and potentially that's what all logic programming languages are. Um, but just get, prepare yourself to basically uh, see a database of assertions and then being able to uh, run sort of queries to get information retrieved from this database is basically what we have. So that's sort of why the uh, thumbnail of this video was Prolog versus SQL, because I felt like this was a lot more similar to like SQL or some kind of database than it was to a logic programming language. 
Um, but I don't know enough about the history of either of those to sort of comment on if they heavily influenced each other. Uh, from that, we will move on to section 4.4.1, uh, deductive information retrieval. And um, the primary point of uh, this subsection is to basically introduce a ton of assertions, which are scattered across a number of pages, and then to introduce uh, rules that you can define and then ways that you can query this information. Um, so let's take a look at the consolidated assertions that this uh, chapter section or subsection uh, introduces. So here I've just put all these assertions in a list of lists, which I'm calling uh, database assertions. And we start off um, with uh, assertions about an individual by the name of Oliver Warbuck Warbucks. The last name goes first here. So we have address, job, and salary. And note that for job, uh, the first element of the um, third element of our high, uh, like the first list is uh, the division that this person works in. So the job is uh, big wheel. Um, administration. Uh, you can see for uh, Ben Bitdiddle, uh, the job here is uh, computer wizard. So the division here is computer. Um, and we've also got computer programmer and computer programmer. And note that uh, we also have supervisor information for the last three individuals. If we move to the next slide, we have similar information just for uh, four more individuals, the same address, job, salary, supervisor, and then some statements uh, about which uh, jobs can do other jobs. So a computer wizard can do both a, a programmer and a technician. A programmer can also do the job of a program, a computer programmer trainee, et cetera. And I believe after this, we have a couple of rules. We're not exhaustively showing all the ones the textbook introduces, but uh, the simplest one you can hear, you can see is a, a pattern matching uh, for the rule same, which just means that uh, X is equal to X. Um, and then lives near is a rule that basically uses the two uh, keywords and and not um, to say that uh, you are living near someone if your town is the same. So basically each time you see this question mark uh, with some characters after it, this is the uh, name of the sort of variable that's being bound to a value in the pattern matching syntax. And so uh, person one and person two are gonna bind sort of, sort of to two different values. Um, and that's going to be ensured by the fact that we have this not same person one, person two. And then uh, we ensure we are ensuring that they live in the same city by the fact that we, do, we have town and town here for both people. Um, so uh, if this was town one and town two, and then we had another statement that said not the same, we could have sort of like lives apart. Um, but because these are the same or, or using the same name, we're going to make sure that they're bound to the same value. Uh, which I think is basically all you need is an introduction to see how uh, this sort of query language works. And the text then goes to show on how you can build these queries, but we're going to jump straight into an exercise uh, to show how this works. So exercise 4.55 states, give simple queries that retrieve the following information from the database. So the first one is all people supervised by Ben Bitdiddle. The second is the names and jobs of all people in the accounting division. And the third is the names and addresses of, addresses of all people who live in Slumerville, Slumerville, not really sure, but uh, we'll start with number one. So all people supervised by Ben Bitdiddle. Basically, this is how we build the query. Uh, everything that we want to match, we just explicitly put there. So for our individual's name, we put, um, uh, or the supervisor's name, we put Ben Bit, Bit, Bit Diddle. And then uh, we put supervisor, because that's what we want uh, Ben Bit Diddle to be. And then for uh, what we want to be found, we just sort of put uh, the syntax for uh, pattern matching here. So X, you can name X whatever you want. And then the query is basically going to uh, return you every assertion that matches this information. Uh, so each of these three um, individuals, Side Effect, uh, Lemme Tweak It, and Alyssa P. Hacker, all are supervised by uh, Ben Bitdiddle. Pretty cool. Moving on to the uh, second part of this question, uh, names and jobs of all the people in the accounting division. Like I mentioned before, the first element of the sort of third element in our list that starts with job is the division. So we want to match a job where the first element is accounting. We can use this dot similar to how dot is used in racket or scheme um, sort of to like match everything after this. So we don't really care if there's one things, two things, three things, uh, dot question mark Y will match all of it. And then uh, the question mark X will match the name of the individual working in the accounting department. So sure enough, the query uh, returns us um, Robert Cratchit and Eben Scrooge, uh, where Robert's a scrivener and Eben is a chief accountant. And last but not least, we have the uh, third part of this question, the names and addresses of all the people who live in Slumerville. Um, so once again, similar to what we've seen before, we just insert everything that we want to match and then uh, add some variables 
uh, for the stuff that we are trying to retrieve. So address and Slumerville, uh, because the city is the first part of the address, and then X for the name of the person and Y for everything else, which is going to be the street name and the number. Um, so here are the three individuals that uh, are returned to us from this query. So pretty neat. Um, we haven't really seen how to add these assertions, um, but we'll get to that later. But once you have this database, you can basically build these queries. Um, these are more simple queries, but you can um, add queries that are sort of compound statements uh, later, which we'll see. And I'll do a little demo at the end to show you how this works, because I think that's the most sort of interesting part of this. We're moving on to the uh, next exercise, which is exercise 4.58. Define a rule that says that a person is a big shot in a division if the person works in the division but does not have a supervisor who works in that division. So they can have a supervisor in a different division, uh, but not a supervisor that is in that division. Um, so uh, defining a rule is going to look uh, as follows. So here we have our uh, assertion. So whenever you want to add assertions to the database, you basically just wrap your uh, list um, in a uh, assert clause, if you will. So assert bang, and then uh, you prefix this with rule, and then you put sort of uh, the composition of what you want this rule to be. So a big shot is a person that's in a division. Uh, and um, so now you're basically matching uh, the division of that individual. Um, with the X lining up here in the division. And then you've got the sort of the part that uh, identifies that they're the big shot down here. So um, the first one is that basically they don't have a supervisor. Um, and the second one is that it's saying uh, they have a supervisor, but they're not, that supervisor is not in the same division. Um, and then once you have this rule set up, you can basically use it in your query. Uh, so big shot dot uh, question mark X just basically matches any big shot. Uh, based on these rules, and then we can just pattern match everything after that. And sure enough, this returns us three individuals, Oliver Warbucks, Evan Scrooge, and Ben Bitdiddle, um, that are each in the administration, uh, accounting, and computer departments, or divisions, I should say. And with that, uh, we're done section 4.4.1. Um, we're moving on now to section 4.4.2, how the query system works. So we're not going to uh, super in-depth go into this, but we're going to highlight a few different things. So the first thing we're going to highlight is where the textbook says, it should be apparent that the query evaluator must perform some kind of search in order to match queries against facts and rules in the database. One way to do this would be to implement the query system as a non-deterministic program using the AMB evaluator of section 4.3. Another possibility is to manage the search with the aid of streams, which we covered in section 3.5, I believe. Um, and then the textbook goes on to state that our implementation follows this second approach. Um, so note that the uh, you know uh, logic programming language that we're going to build up is built on top of uh, the chapter 3.5 streams. Um, what's really irritating though is that when we get to the final subsection of this chapter, it's going to introduce like 400 lines of code, but it's going to leave out 100 lines of code that you need from chapter 3.5. So note that you're, if you're actually trying to go and build this up and get it working in Dr. Racket or whatever editor you choose, you're going to need a lot of the code from uh, chapter 3.5 and the textbook only sort of implicitly refers to this right here. Um, but it becomes clear when you try and run it and it doesn't compile and you realize, oh yes, that's the uh, methods that we defined in chapter 3.5 that you just need to go and grab. Um, chapter or the subsection 4.4.2 on how the query system works goes on to state, uh, you know, about pattern matching. It says a pattern matcher is a program that tests whether some datum fits a specified pattern. For example, the data list, uh, paren, paren, a, b, n, paren, c, paren, a, b, n, paren, n, paren, uh, matches the pattern uh, question mark x c question mark x with the pattern variable uh, question mark x bound to a b. Uh, the same data list matches the pattern uh, question mark x question mark y question mark z with x and z both bound to a b and y bound to c. It also matches the pattern uh, paren paren question mark x uh, question mark y and paren c start paren question mark x question mark y and paren and paren with question mark x bound to a and question mark y bound to b. However, it does not match the pattern uh, question mark x, a, question mark y, since the pattern specifies a list whose second element is the symbol a. Um, so that's a mouthful, uh, but the idea should be pretty clear that you're given a list and you're given a pattern and you need to be able to sort of line up uh, the pattern variables with values that are not sort of contradictory. And as long as you can do that, your pattern matches. Um, the text then goes on to state uh, how we're sort of doing this with streams. So it says in the section stream of frames, the testing of patterns against frames is organized through the use of streams. 
Given a single frame, the matching process runs through the database entries one by one. For each database entry, the matcher generates either a special symbol indicating that the match has failed or an extension to the frame. Uh, the, re the results for all the database entries are collected into a stream which is passed through a filter to weed out the failures. The result is a stream of all the frames that extend the given frame via a match to some assertion in the database. And I believe what we have next is a couple of diagrams that sort of visually show how this, how this works. So um, you have your input uh, stream of frames and your output stream of frames, and um, it's going to sort of be modified by the type of query that we have. So for a sort of simple query, which we'll see in the implementation code later, you're just doing like a stream uh, flat map, which is fine. Uh, but the next slide is going to show what you're doing for sort of a compound statement that uses and. Um, here, basically, you're performing a filter. So it has to uh, adhere to both of the A and B conditions in order to make it to the output stream of frames. Uh, on the next slide here, it shows you the visualization for OR, which is a little bit more complicated. This one's not doing filtering per se. It's doing sort of, uh, you know, a merging of, if you will, of um, streams based on two different conditions. And we'll see later in the implementation code that the uh, function or procedure that we need to or do this to do this is called interleaved, which we implemented back in chapter 3.5. And this is uh, the part of the text that talks about unification, which um, from the footnote that we saw earlier was extremely important for the sort of evolution of logic programming languages. Uh, the text reads, in order to handle rules in the query language, we must be able to find the rules whose conclusions match a given query pattern. Rule conclusions are like assertions, except that they can, they can contain variables. So we will need a generalization of pattern matching called unification, in which both the pattern and the datum may contain variables. Um, now, I've left this sort of example uh, up on the screen. However, I'm not going to read through it, um, but this is a very important part of this chapter. Um, I believe Brian Harvey from the Berkeley Lectures, uh, when he was teaching it, um, he said, you know, you don't need to understand everything about this chapter, uh, but one of the most important parts is this unification algorithm, um, which basically states that you can sort of recursively uh, have variables... Um, that refer to each other uh, within different statements and you have to have a way to like resolve this pattern. Um, and so this this unification algorithm, it's stated in the implementation section of this chapter. It's, it's probably the most technically difficult part of this uh, logic programming language um, and it's worth understanding it. But for the sake of brevity, um, I'm going to skip this. But if you want, pause the video, read the second uh, paragraph and as I mentioned before, um, I definitely recommend you working your way through the full chapter in uh, the textbook. And this brings us to the third subsection. We're going to very, very briefly um, cover this subsection, which is entitled, Is Logic Programming Mathematical Logic? It basically points out um, three different things. I'm going to highlight one of them. The two that we're not going to highlight are basically that there are some deficiencies. You can end up with um, infinite loops uh, in if you don't carefully construct your queries and you can also end up with uh, contradicting queries that are basically compound queries just with the statements uh, reordered. Um, so the point is, is that there are some deficiencies to this uh, logic programming language that we're building up. The main point I think that the chapter is trying to highlight though is something uh, that's captured in the following paragraph. Uh, which reads, there is also a much more serious way in which the not of the query languages, uh, query language differs from the not of mathematical logic. In logic, we interpret the statement not p to mean that p is not true. In the query system, however, not p means that p is not deducible from the knowledge in the database. For example, given the personal database of section 4.4.1, the system would happily deduce all sorts of not statements, such as that uh, ben Bitdiddle is not a baseball fan. Uh, that is not that it is not raining outside, and that two plus two is not four. In other words, the not of logic programming languages reflects the so-called closed world assumption that all irrelevant information has been included in the database. So basically, what this paragraph is stating is that the three statements that uh, Ben doesn't like baseball, it's not raining, and that two plus two plus two is not four, those can all be. Um, deduced due to the fact that we don't have any information or assertions in our database speaking to these facts, um, which is uh, a huge, uh, basically, like, uh, chasm between um, the mathematical knot and the logic programming language knot. 
Um, and this is highlighted in both the MIT lectures and the Berkeley lectures that this, this is due to what's called sort of this closed world paradigm or closed world assumption that you can only get correct, um, you know, responses from your queries that are based off of information that's stored in the database. If you're asking about things that are not stored, you're going to get incorrect um, answers. And with that, I believe this takes us to the final subsection, uh, subsection 4.4.4, subsection implementing the query system. As I mentioned at the beginning of this pre-recording, uh, we're not going to go through all of these sections because it would take way too much time. I'm just going to try and highlight some of the interesting parts of this, but for a comprehensive understanding, um, you're going to have to work through the textbook um, and this uh, subsection from start to finish. Uh, but the interesting parts I think are the following. So this is probably the, the main entry function other than the driver loop that I'm not showing. It's the QEVAL, eval um, where we have a query and a frame stream. Um, and right at the top of this procedure, we've got a let binding, which is uh, assigning uh, the result of get type query of Q eval to QPROC. And then it's checking if QPROC, um, you're basically applying this uh, of the contents of query. Um, and then otherwise doing a simple query. So what is uh, QPROC? How is that determined? Well, get is just using our get and put functions um, from a sort of uh, stored um, hash table, if you will, or a simple implementation of a hash table. And if we take a look, basically we've put all of the following um, using the QEval tag into uh, this hash table. So and corresponds to conjoin uh, or corresponds to disjoin, not corresponds to negate, and then list, val list value and always true correspond to uh, the following. So we're only going to look at the and, or, and not procedures, um, or the corresponding uh, conjoin, disjoin, and negate procedures that uh, correspond to these uh, sort of keywords. Um, so first, we're going to take a look at simple query. As I mentioned before, uh, simple query basically does a, does a flat map. So it's nothing interesting here. Um, this is basically when you're not using and, or, uh, or not, or any of the sort of the keywords that um, build up a compound uh, query. Um, we then move on to the conjoin and disjoin, which correspond to our and and or uh, QPROX. So the point to highlight here is that conjoin is basically doing uh, a filtering and disjoin is basically doing the interleaving, AKA the merging of the two frames. Um, and this I think is intuitively makes sense. We then move on to the negate procedure, and this one's a little bit harder to parse, um, but what you need to recognize is that the if uh, expression here, um, the three lines that follow it are all the if expression. So basically, it's just uh, checking to see if you uh, fail um, or pass the uh, predicate that is um, basically applied using the Q eval, Q eval recursively inside ultimately the first Q eval that you called. And then if so, uh, it's filtering it out. Um, otherwise, it's calling this singleton stream, which is basically just appending this frame to like an empty, an empty list of frames. Um, so basically, uh, it's doing the negation in this if expression here. And once we have that, we sort of skip over the sections that cover the pattern matching and the unification algorithms. And then you get down to, I believe this is like 4.4.4.5 .4 or 6, um, where you have the uh, procedures for actually adding rules or assertions to your database. Um, so you have add rule or assertion that basically just dispatches using a selector off to add rule and add assertion. And inside these, these are basically going to uh, call set bang at the heart of these procedures that are going to uh, basically reassign the assertions uh, uh, consing onto it a new assertion or uh, set banging, doing the same thing for the rules if you have a new rule. And then um, once you have all of this code, like uh, which is about 400 lines, um, you then need to go and find the roughly 100 lines of code that you are missing from chapter 3.5. Um, so you're missing this uh, prompt for input. I believe this is actually just from the previous sort of evaluators, uh, but the display stream, which uh, relies on the display line, and then the stream car and stream cutter, you need all that stuff from chapter 3.5. Once you've gone and added all those 100 lines of code, uh, you then need to go and add the 75 lines of assertions that I showed in chapter section 4.4.1. And then once you have that in your database assertions that I showed, you basically just need to um, add them to uh, your um, 
Q of L uh, query language. And so you can do that just with a for each. There's a number of ways you can do it, but basically it's just for each of the assertions, it's calling add rule or assertion, which is then gonna basically perform the assert bang on each of the assertions. And then you just call this at the end of your code. And once you're done that, so that's 400 lines of code from the book, 100 lines of code from chapter 3.5, and then 75 lines of the sort of assertions that form the database, you are then able to um, hop into Dr. Racket or whatever editor you're using and play around with the uh, query language. So at this point, we're going to hop over to Dr. Racket just to show you um, what this looks like sort of in a small demo. So here we are in Dr. Racket. You can see uh, we're in horizontal view mode. Um, and on the left, we have all of the code that we need to get this query language working. And then when we run it, we get a couple of OKs saying that we have successfully um, added some assertions. And uh, the first thing we need to do is type in a query driver loop, and that's going to kick off uh, the QDL. And at this point, we have now added all of the assertions from section 4.4.1. So very simply, like one of the easiest queries we can do is just to match um, all of the folks that have jobs. And so you can see here, here are all of the, the individuals that have jobs in our database. And then uh, from here, we can start to do more interesting things. So you can see that there's a number of divisions, administration, accounting, computer. Um, so if we wanted to see all of the people um, that are in the uh, accounting division, uh, X will match the person, uh, division will match. Um, uh, so if we actually want to do computer, we have to explicitly put this in here and then we can match everything after this. Uh, note that for the second uh, pattern variable, we need to use a different name than the first one. And if we do this, we should get all of the individuals that uh, work as a computer um, uh, in the computer division. So we have obviously the computer programmer trainee, uh, the computer programmer and the computer wizard. Um, so uh, it's it's a very simple um, you know query language. Right now we're just doing pretty simple things. So if I go address uh, dot question mark, this is gonna give us the addresses of all the individuals. And you can see from you know just these couple small simple examples that it's uh, a pretty powerful system. Um, that basically you can construct any sort of pattern that you want to match. Um, and if we want, I guess we can do like one compound example. Um, so say we want to uh, get uh, the supervisors of all of the uh, computer programmers. Um, so if we take the uh, if we take the first pattern match that we had where we matched all of the people in the computer division um, and just add that again. So now X is going to be bound to the name of the individual that works in the computer division. We can now add a second one that says uh, supervisor um, and then use the same pattern variable name. Uh, and I believe if we do this, except we need to use a different name, so add Z to that and finish this. Um, you can see now that uh, we have, if I drag this over so that it prints a little bit more nicely, we have all of the people that work sort of as a computer program uh, in the computer division, and then the supervisors of each of those individuals. So you can see that uh, Alyssa P. Hacker is the supervisor of Louis Reasoner, uh, Ben Bitdiddle is the uh, supervisor of Let Me Tweak It, et cetera. Um, so this is an example of a compound query that uses the and keyword, and you can go crazy with these. Um, you can start building rules as we saw in one of the exercises. And it's a pretty powerful system that just basically does an exhaustive search using um, the streams facility. And uh, yeah, with that, we'll hop back to the slides and we'll cover just a couple things that I wanted to highlight from the lectures. So there are only two things or two quotes that I wanted to highlight from the lectures. The first one is from uh, the MIT lecture given by Gerald Sussman, where he says, you should be drawing lessons on two levels. The first is to realize just how different a language can be. If you think that the jump from Fortran to Lisp is a big deal, you haven't seen anything yet. And this is him referring to the jump to uh, this logic programming language. Uh, what is called the query language, um, but it, more generally to just any programming languages. So we're used to seeing languages from sort of the Algol family of which Fortran uh, definitely derives, um, but other languages can look vastly different. Um, in this case, the program logic programming language. And last but not least, uh, from the uh, Berkeley 
lectures, uh, lecture 42 on logic programming. Uh, Brian Harvey at one point states that this system works by pattern matching, which I thought was just, yeah, it's a good quote to summarize uh, the whole chapter section 4.4. Um, this logic programming language to me just feels like I said at the beginning, a fancy pattern matching engine. Um, but maybe that is what logic programming languages are at the end of the day. And with that, that brings us to the end of our video. Um, I hope you enjoyed and learned something. That brings us to the end of chapter four. Uh, next week, we will be covering the first section of chapter five, um, five point one, which I believe has to do with register machines. So looking forward to covering that. And I hope to see you in the next video.